They invented a place. It was far away from here, indeed anywhere, high up at the limits, like a sheiling. He particularly liked the word sheiling, a bare place, as far up the valley as you could go, and the house itself very simple. In reality, such dwellings, the sheilings, are only for habitation in the summer, the brief summer, but theirs they allowed themselves to proof almost snugly against the winter months. In winter, the long winter, this place of their invention would be needed most. So he fitted a chimney that drew remarkably well and built a hearth out of the rough stones that were lying around. There was little fuel, of course, a few almost petrified roots, very hard to saw. So when they climbed to this place at the top of the valley, they always carried a billet or two of firewood in their packs. He liked the word billet in that usage. Not that they ever did climb to it, not in the flesh. It was a place for our thoughts and dreams to go to, she said, a sort of safe house for them, not for us in the flesh. Why the need for such a place? She asked me did I understand the word dejection. I replied that I did. Well, she said, when he saw me in my state of dejection, or more especially when he had to leave me in that state, he begged me to try to lift my spirits by imagining a place where it would be easier to breathe and where my voice, which in the dejected state seemed to sink far into my chest, might revive and come forth again. Will you be there too, she asked. Will we be quiet? He said he would, of course he would. Sometimes, at least, they would be there together, and yes, they would be quiet. He said it would do her good to imagine herself in a high and remote place where the air was a joy to breathe and him there with her, sometimes at least, quietly. In fact, he was the least restful of men, could never sit still, must always be anxiously ordering things in a preemptive sort of way. You don't trust your life, do you, she said, which means you don't trust us. Often when I think of you, of your anxiety, I get so nervous for you, for us both, I would almost rather be in the state of dejection where I don't feel anything much. This hurt him like a reproach, and he answered back to hurt her too, that whenever he dreamed of her it did him more harm than good. When he told me how he dreamed of me, she said, what night dreams and day dreams he had of me, I was very hurt. He saw me taking somebody else's arm and turning away. He saw himself coming to my house and getting no answer and standing there on the step like any hawker. It hurt me terribly, she said. I was all the more dejected. Why could we never be a reassuring place for our thoughts and dreams of one another? In the sheiling, she said, we had only the necessary things, a bed, table, two chairs, the few things wanted for living there a while. Even books, we had very few, nine at the most, that was the rule. If we added one, we must take one away. In truth, the sheiling was a sparsely furnished place, and it seems they were never there for long, not even in thinking and dreaming did they absent themselves for long, nor did they allow themselves to be there together very often. I said I'd have thought it would do them most good to imagine climbing to the sheiling, opening it up, making it homely again, together. She blushed like a girl, agreeing. Nonetheless, she said, the times when they dreamed or thought themselves there together were few. Mostly each went alone. The long and arduous climb, the opening up, the settling in, was solitary. And I wondered how that could help. Did it not rather make things worse to climb in thoughts and dreams to their shared invention and be solitary in it? But she said no, certainly not for her, and she's truly believed not for him either, did being in the sheiling alone, she without him, he without her, make their situation worse. The virtue of the place lay in its being their invention, in their having made it so clear on all the senses, everything so solid, necessary, useful and to hand. Therein lay the virtue of the place, she said. And she added that she loved the word virtue when it had that sense. 
how she smiled, how her face lit up when she confessed to me in a rush of words that even in the busy city where they were obliged to meet, in all the noise and trample of other people and in all the anxiety of clocks and timetables, if they began to dwell on the exact shape and colouring of a particular hearthstone in their shielding, on the wooden handle of a knife and its cheerful mismatch with the bone handle of a fork, dwelling on those and any dozen other concrete facts, they could abstract themselves completely and were as happy as children in the details of their invention. Dwelling on is a lovely expression, don't you think? Dwelling on and in, the indwelling virtue of the place. So either might sit down at the table with or without a fire and sleep alone and wake in the bed alone and still there was virtue in it, great power to help. And at the table, moving aside the plate and the glass, he wrote a note or quite a long letter for her or she for him to find, having climbed alone, pushed open the door and paused before stepping in. Or laid a book on the table from the frugal library whose contents changed according to mood and need and put a slip of paper in it to mark a particular page and a scribbled word, read this, tell me what you think. 